Our next speaker for this day is Dr. Ram Gopalakrishnan. Actually, I must say he is a household name in IAT. Uh, most of our patients are, are being referred to him and we always get gui guided by Sir from Apollo. He is a senior consultant in Institute of Infectious Diseases, Apollo Hospital and Apollo Children Hospital. I now hand over the guys to Dr. Ram. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Ramkrishnan's excellent talk kept you from falling sleepy, but let's see I will, whether I will be able to do the same before lunch. Uh, this is what I'll be covering. So uh, just imagine yourself sitting in that swanky uh, examination room of yours, and uh, I'm going to run you through some case scenarios, and uh, we'll see what is the correct approach to treat some of these diseases, which you'll all agree form the bread and butter of your practice. Right? If you are in primary care practice, uh, this is what you will be seeing day in and day out. So we will start with some common case scenarios uh, which, uh, which you will see day in and day out. A 22 year old female presents with a 4 day history of malaise, nasal discharge, initially watery and white but now greenish yellow. No fever at all, exam shows only congested nasal turbinates. The diagnosis is not at all difficult, this is the common cold. Uh, so what would be the correct treatment approach to this patient? Would you give oral phenylpropanolamine? Would you give an antihistamine? Would you give an antibiotic? Would you give a topical decongestant or NSAID? Now, there is not necessarily one right answer. There may be more than one right answer. Uh, one answer I would avoid here is oral phenylpropanolamine. This is a young female. That class of drugs has been associated with intracranial hemorrhage. So that, 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 that should probably be avoided. Um, topical leach congestion is fine, NSAID is fine, antibiotic is probably not such a good an answer, I'll show you why. Uh, the cold is a little bit different from other infections elsewhere because it's largely due to chemical mediators and neurogenic reflexes rather than any destructive effect on the mucosa. And the problem here is you have the eustachian tube and the sinus ostia which end up in the nose and therefore blockage of these tubes is going to result in a complicating otitis or a complicating bacterial sinusitis. But this doesn't happen often. It happens 1 in 50 times for otitis, 1 in 200 times when you get a cold for sinusitis. So if you treat all patients with antibiotics, you will be treating a large number of them unnecessarily. So if you open your textbooks, the chapter on common cold, we rarely read that during our MBBS training, right? At least I never read it. I used to read this book called Davidson's. I'm not sure if it's still around for medicine and there is no chapter on common cold or at least if it was there I didn't read it. We just did what our elders and what our peers treated the common cold with. So what actually works in randomized trials sedating antihistamines, you know, the non-sedating ones like fexofenadin or levocetrizin don't work. Decongestants, yes that is uh, uh, not phenylpropanolamine that causes bleeding. You can use the topical ones, ipratropium which is an anticholinergic drug. What about zinc? Yes, it does work if you start it really early within 24 hours of symptoms. But tell me, how often does a, doc, does a doctor see a patient within 24 hours of symptoms? Hardly ever. What doesn't work? Vitamin C and echinacea. This is a popular herbal remedy. There's certainly no role for antibiotics. And as of now, there is no role for antivirals either. They used, there was a drug called pleconaril which went into trials for the syndrome, but it wasn't approved because of some drug interactions with other drugs. So please don't use antibiotics for colds. They just don't work. Symptomatic treatment is, is what is needed. Also, if there are any ENT surgeons here, they're going to go out of business because we no longer recommend adenoidectomies for recurrent URIs. This, is, this was popular among ENT surgeons, but there's a large trial which got published in uh, the British Medical Journal which showed that just weightful watching compared with adenoidectomy was equivalent because the natural history is improvement over time. So ENT surgeons are going to be doing less adenoidectomies for recurrent upper respiratory infections in the future. Our next patient, uh, another 27-year-old female, presents with mucoid nasal discharge, sinus pressure, and stuffiness for the last three days. Exam reveals a temperature of 98.9 and tenderness on pressure over the maxillary sinuses. How would you treat this patient? This is quite obviously acute sinusitis. Again, the same choices as in the previous patient. Again, many of the same considerations apply. But in some situations, you may need to use an antibiotic. I'll tell you where. 
the reality is most patients with sinusitis have a viral infection that is what causes sinusitis and if you run all patients with a common cold through a CT scan machine you will find that the majority of them 87 percent of them actually have sinus opacification and if you ask the patient do you have yellow purulent nasal discharge and they say yes that means a bacterial infection only half the time so even that history is not reliable. If you truly have a bacterial sinusitis, the two main organisms are the pneumococcus and Haemophilus influenzae. So there are many studies on acute sinusitis on the literature, but the truth is 50% spontaneous resolution of this syndrome within three days. They have studied amoxicillin clavulanate, cefiroxime with good cure rates. One study showed that three days of cotrimoxazole is as good as 10 days. And if you look at studies of studies, so-called meta-analyses, then you need to treat 13 adults to benefit one. In other words, 12 adults either have a virus or just have bacteria which go away on their own. And then that number is lower in children. So sinusitis is, is certainly worthwhile treating in children, but just know that a large majority of patients have viral infections. More recent studies, amoxicillin versus placebo for sinusitis, all you got was diarrhea from the amoxicillin. Similarly, amoxicillin clavulanate. Patient comes in with diarrhea, sorry, comes in with sinusitis and goes out with diarrhea if you use an antibiotic. So really, when do you use antibiotics for sinusitis? There is a good guideline published on this, which is well worth reading. The drugs of choice, symptomatic treatment drugs of choice are non-steroidals and antihistamines. When would you actually use an antibiotic? If somebody is symptomatic for more than 10 days, it is presumed that viral immunity kicks in in about 5 to 7 days. If they are symptomatic for longer than that, think of a bacterium. If they have severe symptoms for so more than 3 days, if they have double sickening, you have all seen this, patient gets a virus, gets better and then gets worse again, that suggests a bacterial super infection. If they have a molar tooth infection, that is a different syndrome. It's not from the nose, it's coming up from the tooth. If they have clearly unilateral facial erythema or edema, again suggests a need for antibiotics. And again, if they have unilateral nasal discharge, it suggests one side is blocked and infected. So once you decide to treat sinusitis, which antibiotic would you use, which is actually the name of my talk, antibiotic selection for respiratory infections, simple, amoxicillin, clavulanate. Many of your drug companies are going to be out of business by the time I finish this talk. So you don't have to think too much for sinusitis, right? Majority of the time you're dealing with a virus. The rest of the time amoxicillin clavulanate is good enough. You could use other drugs like quinolones. We suggest you avoid cephalosporins. Duration of treatment, not very long. Five to seven days in adults, 10 days in children. Some situations where there are comorbidities or where there is recent antibiotic exposure, double the dose of amoxicillin clavulanate, basically to cover penicillin resistant pneumococcus, not a major problem in India. Our next patient, 16 years old, healthy, presents with a sore throat, right? Exam reveals a temperature of 101 and you can see those, those, those white patches on the tonsils. No cervical nodes. It's a very, very common clinical syndrome in practice. So this is acute pharyngitis. What are your options here? Would you give a macrolide like azithromycin, oral cephalosporin? Would you get a throat culture? Would you get a rapid streptococcal screen, which is not widely done in India? Or would you do that and proceed to a throat culture if negative? So these are the options for a very, very common syndrome, which is often treated wrong. And why is that? If you look at the causes of acute pharyngitis, it is largely bacterial. It is usually streptococcal versus viral. The causes, if you look at that list, if you look at treatable causes, hardly any, mainly streptococcus. This is a sexually transmitted disease. We hardly see diphtheria. Whereas all these viruses, there's very little treatment available. So most of the time, your decision is, is this strep or is this a respiratory virus? So the approach to pharyngitis basically is to get you to decide, are you dealing with a rheumatogenic strain of streptococcus? That's the one that, uh, that uh, licks the throat and bites the heart, right? So if you pick that up, then you'll be doing your patient a service. The rest of it gets better on its own, whatever you do. The center score is a very useful clinical score. The presence of exudates on the pharynx, the presence of tender cervical adenopathy, fever, and absence of cough. That's very useful. We had a whole lecture on cough. Absence of cough suggests something that is localized to the pharynx, suggests a streptococcus. 
And again other features favoring strep versus virus are virus, you know, rhinorrhea, hoarseness, conjunctivitis, cough, etc. All of that suggests virus. Okay. Streptococcal pharyngitis is exclusively a pharyngitis. But whatever you do, you really cannot make the diagnosis with 100 percent accuracy. So, you just have to rely on tests most of the time. Certainly, please do not treat streptococcal or any sore throat empirically without confirmation. So, there is a new guideline once again on acute pharyngitis. So, we suggest you do a streptococcal screen. If you have that screening test, that is good. If you do not, just go to a throat culture. It is very simple. Throat culture, go, grow streptococcus, treat it. Does not grow streptococcus, do not treat. The latest guidelines also say that if somebody has typical features of a virus, say 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 uh, say, far, uh, say laryngitis, uh, running nose, etc., don't even bother with testing. Just don't give an antibiotic. It's completely unnecessary. And don't do ASO titers <coughs> as well. This is a post-infectious phenomenon. It will not help you during the course <coughs> of the acute infection. Treatment of streptococcal pharyngitis easy to treat. Resistance of streptococcus has never been reported. So, my favorite treatment is one shot of intramuscular penicillin or you can give an oral, oral, oral penicillin and if you want to spend the patient's money, you can go with other costlier antibiotics. Next respiratory syndrome, two year old boy presents with ear pain, otoscopy reveals a bulging tympanic membrane, very easy diagnosis. This is acute otitis media. What would you do? Would you start antibiotics? Would you watch and wait for spontaneous resolution? Would you give broader spectrum antibiotics? Now, if you look at the causes of otitis media, again, they are quite similar to the causes of acute sinusitis. Basically, it is viral. If it gets super, if it gets complicated by a bacterial infection, it is going to be pneumococcus, haemophilus or maraxella. There is a new bug described which keeps us ID physicians in business, but do not worry about these new bugs. Most of the time, it is the traditional bugs, pneumococcus, etc., that you are dealing with. Guidelines for otitis media are now very clear. Under the age of 3, there are large trials showing that you can watch and wait. Okay? If you give antibiotics, all that you get is diarrhea from the antibiotic. And over the age of 3, I, I sorry, I, I said that the other way around. <clears throat> Under the age of 3, all you need to do is to treat the patient. Over the age of 3, you can watch and wait. And uh, there is a guideline published on this which pr says pretty much the same thing. Under the age of 2, unilateral disease, mild disease, watch and wait. On the other hand, bilateral disease, treat the patient. If the patient is not responding, again treat the patient. So, depending upon whether both ears are involved, depending upon the age of the patient, you can use an antibiotic. The drug of choice is amoxicillin. In children, even amoxicillin clavulanate is not necessary because of the preponderance of pneumococcus. So, very narrow spectrum antibiotics based upon the age and whether unilateral or bilateral involvement is present. Our next patient is could be any one of us in this room. This is a 35 year old non smoker who has cough for 5 days. Cough was initially dry but now is productive of thick yellow sputum. Lungs are clear, temperature is normal, saturation is good, chest x ray is clear. So, what is the diagnosis? This is the acute bronchitis syndrome. Right? What will you treat this patient with? Amoxicillin, azithromycin, oral cephalosporin, levofloxin or NSAID and a an salbutamol inhaler. Clearly, there is only one right answer here. I think it is not very difficult to guess. The non-antibiotic answer is the right answer here. And uh, first of all, what do we do? See, this is one syndrome which uh, WHO has identified as the single largest area where antibiotics are used unnecessarily. Okay. And it is not just a problem in developing countries like ours, it is a big problem in the West. If you look at all these Western countries, they use antibiotics for these syndromes a lot of the time. But is that really true? Now, we are all taught that if you are coughing up yellow sputum, that is bad, that is bacterial, please write an antibiotic. Actually, that is not true. It is caused by an enzyme called myeloperoxidase, which is present in, in any WBC and it will be there whether you are dealing with a virus or with a bacterium. So, it does not predict a response to antibiotics. So, if you look at the causative agents of acute bronchitis, they are largely virus. It does not matter which virus, there is a confusing array of names. The point is none of them can be treated, whether it is influenza or newer viruses. Uh, occasionally, if somebody is coughing for prolonged periods of time, then think of pertussis. 
right? You had a chapter on, you had a lecture on chronic cough, but largely acute bronchitis, acute cough syndrome is viral in etiology. And this is the natural history of these patients. When they come, they have a lot of symptoms. They may have fever in the beginning, but the fever goes away and they're all left with prominent respiratory symptoms. So if they come to you on day four, day five, then you know this is acute bronchitis. Here you are not so sure, you may need to rule out pneumonia, but here you are quite sure of the diagnosis and it can take a long time for those symptoms to subside. Do antibiotics work in acute bronchitis? Well, many randomized trials in the literature, absolutely no difference in duration of cough, sputum, chest discomfort or return to work. And there was a big study in Lancet which showed that three days of azithromycin is the same as placebo. Another recent trial in BMJ showing that the antibiotic benefit is really too small and no recommendation for antibiotics unless the chest x-ray shows pneumonia. This is another very recent trial in Lancet last year, amoxicillin for non-pneumonic respiratory tract infections, 2000 patients from Europe. Conclusion, slight benefit and some harm. So antibiotics really are not the way to go. Perhaps you can do this particular test called procalcitonin. Now procalcitonin is a biomarker which is elevated in bacterial infections. In India, it is not a point of care test. In other words, you can't use it in your, in your clinic setting. You have to send it off to a lab. It takes a day or so to return. So it's not useful for clinical decision making. But if it's available as a point of care test, this may help us. Elevated procalcitonin, bacterial infection, antibiotics. If that is negative, then you don't need antibiotics. So what do your books say about acute bronchitis? If you look at the small Sanford guide on antibiotics, antimicrobial therapy only if pneumonia is present, purulent sputum alone, not an indicator. If you look at a textbook of infectious disease, value of antibiotics is uncertain and is not recommended as a general practice. But you can't have that patient leave your consulting room with a, without a prescription, right? Otherwise, they'll just go to the doctor next door and you will lose your practice. So you send the patient home happy with a salbutamol inhaler or with a non-steroidals, which actually give a lot of trite next time you get acute bronchitis, you get a lot of symptomatic relief. But please don't give an antibiotic. They don't work in any way over here. Next in Rome, this is a smoker. He's 67 years old. He's been smoking for a number of years. Comes in with worsening dyspnea, wheezing and cough. The chest x-ray does not show a pneumonia. That is very important and there is there are bilateral ronchi. So would you use an antibiotic for this patient? This is COPD exacerbation. Would you give amoxicillin, amoxicillin clavulanate or any one of the other antibiotic choices or would you say none of the above? You've just been telling me not to give antibiotics, no antibiotics for this guy. So this is a little more complicated. COPD exacerbation one third of the time is due to a virus. but the rest of the time, it is due to a bacterial super infection. They are always colonized with bacteria in their respiratory tree. But when they acquire a new strain, there are about 100, 100 strains of pneumococcus. When they get a new strain, they get a bacterial exacerbation. Do antibiotics work? The answer is probably and to a small extent. If you look at a meta-analysis, you get about a 22% benefit. That's not a large benefit from antibiotics. And if you do a PEFR, bedside, that flow meter, you only get a 10 liter per minute increase in PEFR. And the benefit is more for inpatient, somebody serious enough to end up in a hospital rather than for outpatients. So antibiotics in COPD exacerbations, first of all, treat with other measures, bronchodilators, beta stimulants, steroids, aminophilin, etc. Don't worry about the color of the sputum. Target pneumococcus haemophilus influenzae and the drug of choice for that is amoxicillin clavulanate. It is appropriately narrow, covers all the bugs under question. Doxycycline is a useful alternative and target patients who are sick enough to be hospitalized. Outpatients don't really benefit. They will get away and they will get better with the bronchodilators you give them. Now you need to be aware that there is preventive therapy available for COPD exacerbation. This drug called azithromycin, not only does it treat bacteria, but it has a prominent anti-inflammatory effect. And this large trial showed that if you put a COPD patient on azithromycin for one year, then you will reduce the number of flares. Okay, you have to treat three patients for one patient to get benefit. Uh, there is some problem with hearing when you use continuous azithromycin. Also be careful of azithromycin in elderly patients. We don't use this drug in settings where coronary artery disease is common, say a critical care unit. It has been shown to cause sudden death. 
because of uh, torsadistic points. So be careful in the elderly, not a problem in younger persons and pick your patients carefully if you are using this strategy, long term azithromycin, make sure their hearing is okay, make sure they are not elderly patients or those with pre-existing conduction problems. Next patient, this is a 56 year old male, previously healthy, comes in with cough, fever and pleuritic pain, exam, crackles and chest x-ray infiltrate. Oxygen saturation is okay, 98%. So what is the best treatment for this patient with community acquired pneumonia? Doxycycline, amoxiclav, oral cephalosporin, azithro, ciprofloxacin or one of the newer quinolones, patient is quite wealthy. All of you would agree that this patient would need an antibiotic. So if you look at the etiologies for community acquired pneumonia, it is largely pneumococcal. Pneumococcus is right at the top of the list, whether it's outpatient or whether it's inpatient, followed by mycoplasma. And then that's not something that's very common. However, the reason why it's not common is you can't culture it. It is one of those bugs you can't culture. You need other tests for diagnosis, usually not worthwhile ordering tests when the treatment is far cheaper than the test and the test itself misses a large number of early patients. So it's usually streptococcus or mycoplasma. It can be haemophilus or chlamydophilia or respiratory viruses a lot of the time. How else would you know what the bug is in this patient? Clinical clues. If the patient is an alcoholic, think of pneumococcus, think of an anaerobic aspiration pneumonia or gram-negative bacteria. If there is COPD, pneumococcus, the traditional pathogens. Elderly tend to get gram-negatives in addition to pneumococcus. If there is poor dental hygiene, think of aspiration and anaerobic etiology. If there is exposure to birds, chlamydia cytosai, that is specifically associated with pet birds. If there is an SCAR, right, always search a patient's body carefully for an SCAR. When you have a pneumonia, think of scrub typhus, I will show you. If you have travel, think of diseases endemic to that place of travel. A lot of patients in IIT may go to the US and back. Think of where they went to the US. For instance, fungal infections like coccidioides. If they are exposed to farm animals, right, any rural setting, farm exposure, think of coxiella. Flu outbreak, which is quite common in congregate settings like a hostel, influenza is classical. And HIV, think of pneumococcus and TB if it's early, think of pneumocystis if it is late. There are three pathogens you should know well about because I've seen numerous patients from IIT with uh, the first two of these diseases. Scrub typhus, leptospirosis and Burkholderia pseudomyelae. Scrub is quite common in India. As you can see, India is one of the endemic zones for this infection and it's been widely reported in the lay press as well. You don't have to go into a scrubby area. All those forests you have right here in your campus are good enough to give you scrub typhus. When to suspect any disease looking like leptospirosis, the so-called leptangamushi syndrome, that's leptospirosis, hantavirus and tsutsukomushi fever. Anybody with leukocytosis and thrombocytopenia, you know, your usual causes of thrombocytopenia like malaria and dengue will not cause leukocytosis, they cause leukopenia. So when you see leukocytosis with thrombocytopenia, a light should flash, this is scrub typhus. If you have cholestatic hepatitis, anybody with jaundice and fever, if you have an SCAR, if you have meningitis or an atypical pneumonia, bilateral symmetrical infiltrates, x-ray looks worse than the patient, think of scrub typhus. This can be how bad scrub typhus can get and this is what you really need to look for. Please examine the patients carefully. This is typically found in genital areas or in the submammary area. So please undress the patient and look carefully. You don't need any diagnostic tests once you pick up this physical sign. This is scrub typhus. These are all patients photographed uh, in our practice. And uh, this is the distribution of uh, lesions, typically in areas which we often miss unless we disrobe the patient properly and examine them. Diagnosis, there is specific serology available. This is offered by many labs in our city. Do not do the wild felix test. That is basically of historic interest. Do get the specific serology, immunofluorescence or the ELISA pan bio kit, which is readily available. It's fairly sensitive and specific to pick up this infection. Leptospirosis is a consideration, especially when there is water exposure or during the monsoons, when you have to wade through water or can often cause a hemorrhagic pneumonia and uh, associated jaundice with the full, full uh, package of wild syndrome and renal failure. 
Melioidosis is another bug you need to think of, especially in your elderly and your diabetics. India is one of the endemic areas. It can present either with a pneumonia or with abscesses, either in the joint or in the bone or in the spleen, etc. And it can even mimic TB because chronic melioidosis has a granulomatous histopathology. They can come in with sepsis, with multiple nodular infiltrates or with more chronic presentations. Okay? The clue is to think about this disease in any diabetic who is pro progressing rapidly. And diagnosis is quite easy. All you have to do is to order blood cultures, sputum cultures or pus cultures depending upon where the disease is. You will easily pick it up. It grows readily. Okay? Always tell your lab whatever grows identified. Often labs will grow a non-fermenter and they will discard it thinking it is a contaminant. You will never identify it down to the, spe the genus and the species level. Viruses. Viruses are important. This term influenza like li influenza like illness. ILI is important. This was a study of ILI showing that many of these patients are severe enough to end up in the hospital. So a lot of the times when you have pneumonia, it's actually a severe virus which ends up in the hospital. Numerous viruses cause this, this syndrome, influenza like illness. But what we are really worried about is H1N1 because this is the one treatable viral pneumonia. They often have a prodrome of upper respiratory type illness and they may have diarrhea as well. Ask for a history of similar illness among children, others in the family and, and you need to catch them before they end up with this kind of x-ray. H1N1 diagnosis, beware of rapid antigen tests. Okay? Please go straight for PCR tests. If you are thinking of this diagnosis, most of the time if it is an outpatient, you do not need to test, you do not need to treat. They just get better on their own. You really need to test and treat only for patients who are bad enough to ad get admitted to the hospital. And this is one situation where you order your test and straight away start your antiviral. You stop the antiviral if the test is negative. You do not wait for the report because you lose precious time in these patients. So when you have patients with community acquired pneumonia, please order a chest x-ray always. Do not go by physical exam. I will tell you why. If for some reason you cannot get an x-ray, for instance, patient is pregnant, okay, uh, please do an ultrasound that can help pick up consolidation. Use pulse oximetry. This is very, very useful in your clinics just to tell you how sick this patient is. And do not test out patients. Testing is a waste of time. You can predict this is going to be pneumococcus, mycoplasma, etc. So do not test out patients at all. And do not rely too much on physical exam. Physical exam is fine if you pick up findings like crackles or bronchial breathing. But this was a study of professors from whom the x-ray findings were hidden. And they found that the professors actually picked up the pneumonia only 50 to 70 percent of the time. They missed the diagnosis. So always get a chest x-ray before you tell a patient you do not have pneumonia. Then decide how severe it is. Look at any one of these scores. The most commonly used bedside score is the CURB 65 score. Confusion, uremia, respiratory rate high, low blood pressure, age greater than 65 and very simple. If they have a score of 1, you treat them as an outpatient. More than 1, you admit them. More than 3, they need ICU care. So useful way of deciding where your patient needs to end up. Now these are some guidelines from the West and I have modified them for our Indian situation, what antibiotics are appropriate for community acquired pneumonia? If you have a previously healthy patient like your typical IIT student here, okay, macrolide, azithromycin or clarithromycin is the drug of choice because it does well against pneumococcus as well as mycoplasma which would be the number one cause of pneumonia in this situation. Similarly, doxycycline that would give you some cover against scrub typhus as well which is quite common here. If you have comorbidities right, diabetes or congestive heart failure, elderly patient, then add specific pneumococcal coverage, amoxicillin clavulanate, it will cover staph aureus as well, plus the macrolide. The other option is a newer generation quinolone, but there are some reservations about that, I will show you why. For children, it is pneumococcus, pneumococcus, pneumococcus. You do not even have mycoplasma often in children. So amoxicillin is really the drug you need to treat and just 5 to 10 days maximum is, is good is treatment. You only need to add mycoplasma cover for older children, 12 to 18 years of age. Young children, amoxicillin, older children, amoxicillin plus macrolide. Certain antibiotics are to be avoided. Quite simply, if it starts with ceph, avoid it. Whatever is ceph is not a good word. 
Okay. Many other antibiotics have no role in your outpatient practice for pneumonia. Gemifloxacin, this disease, this, this antibiotic has a 20 percent incidence of rash if you use it in young women. Cipro and, and ofloxacin have no pneumococcal activity, they are basically gram negative spectrum drugs. Linozolide is completely unnecessary, does not cover H flu as well. Chloramphenicol will only give your patient aplastic anemia, erythromycin, diarrhea and roxithromycin photosensitivity. So please do not use any of these antibiotics. If your patient is bad enough to get admitted to the hospital, what are your considerations? Again same bugs, pneumococcus, mycoplasma, the only difference here is that Legionella comes into the list as well, but largely the spectrum of bugs is quite the same. What tests would you order for an inpatient pneumonia? Blood and sputum cultures are optional. You do not want to do them, do not do them because by and large you can predict what is going on. They are more important in elderly or those with comorbidities who may not improve quickly. However, you should consider H1N1 testing, right, if there is an outbreak going on and these urinary tests are again more important in very severely ill patient. Clinically, you should be able to decide is this an atypical or a typical pneumonia. Atypical, you, know, you need macrolide based therapy, typical you need pneumococcal therapy or are there risk factors for aspiration. So guidelines for treating inpatient pneumonia, you start off with a beta lactam. You can use again amoxicillin clavulanate is great, but so are the third generation, this should be cefotaxime or ceftriaxone plus a macrolide azithro or clarithromycin, alternatively doxycycline is just fine. Respiratory tract fluoroquinolones are also on that list, uh, but I but will tell you more about them. And you can consider adding these drugs if you suspect say scrub or MRSA or H1N1. So this is a this is the guideline for treatment of inpatient pneumonia. Fluoroquinolones, however, are not a good idea in the Indian situation. We all know that India is a TB endemic country and in fact, if I have a patient with fever of unknown origin who gets better after a course of quinolones, immediately I think of TB. Is this mycobacterium responding to TB? And it has been shown that if you have a pneumonia and you take a course of quinolones, that you will get better. But if it is tuberculosis, you will also get better temporarily only to relapse later. So Indian guidelines do not recommend quinolones for use in new in community acquired pneumonia as do international guidelines say for instance this guideline which showed that fluoroquinolones are associated with delayed treatment and resistance in tuberculosis and to avoid them in developing countries or countries where tuberculosis is also common. We have many other alternative drugs. How long would you treat a pneumonia? Pneumococcus and other bacteria until afebrile for 72 hours. Usually it is just 5 to 7 days. You do not need prolonged treatment. Remember azithromycin is an intracellular drug which persists for a long time. So 3 days of therapy equals 6 days of actual intracellular levels. Atypical pneumonia needs treatment for up to 2 weeks if you confirm that diagnosis. Patient is not improving. What would you consider? Is Are you giving the right dose? Patient is taking it. Is it, is it something wrong with the host? Is there an empyema, a bronchial obstruction? Or have you got the pathogen wrong? You misdiagnosed TB or is this a viral pneumonia? Or is this just not an infection? Occasionally diseases like bronchiolitis obliterans, Wegener's can all present similar to a pneumonia. So this is my approach to antibiotics for outpatient respiratory tract infections. It's similar to this movie, the good, the bad and the ugly where uh, the, the good amoxicillin clavulanate, azithromycin, clarithromycin, the bad, they will do the job but they have some problems, respiratory tract fluoroquinolones like moxie and levofloxacin and the ugly, older quinolones and all cephalosporins. So antibiotics greatly simplified for you. So my take home message is the majority of upper respiratory tract infections do not need antibiotics. Pneumonia in the outpatient department needs no tests, just get a chest x-ray, amoxclav and azithro are the most valuable oral antibiotics. If you are interested in infectious disease, please join our society, our clinical infectious disease society and if you come to uh, Bangalore uh, August 22nd to 24th, there are numerous sessions covering all aspects of ID from community practice to tuberculosis to malaria if you want to learn more. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for that excellent presentation on antibiotics for respiratory infection. Uh, since we are behind schedule, I am not, uh, there won't be any question time. And uh, we will now give a small moment on behalf of the IIT hospital.